We have talked plenty about what has gone wrong with the Flames, but let's shed a little light on what has kind of gone right. Your Locked On Flames, your daily podcast on the Calgary Flames. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Locked on Flames. As always, I'm your host, Jess Belmosto, and thank you so much for joining me here today. And we are joined by my partner in crime, Nick Sararis. Nick, how are you doing today? My voice is finally starting to come back after the weekend. It's Wednesday, and I'm still recovering from my weekend. I, I definitely will mute myself if you're watching on YouTube to hack <laughs> a little bit. But other than that, I'm very glad to be here. Well, we are very glad to have you back on today's episode, and today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off of your first purchase. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, a little bit of everything, really. Uh, the Flames special teams had a big night last night, so we're going to take a little, a wider angle look at that, as well as some Jonathan Huberdeau stuff, and of course... We have to wrap the show with what went wrong this season because there, there's plenty to discuss there. Uh, but make sure you're subscribed to Locked On Flames wherever you get your podcasts as well as YouTube uh, so you never miss a show. We are here for you Monday through Friday, five days a week, your team every day. I am fascinated with this team in every possible way. I shouldn't be impressed that they pulled out a win over the Sharks, but here I am. I mean, they're like 3-11 and 11 in their last 14 games, to be fair. So, like, any win at this point is a little bit surprising, even if it is against... I don't use this lightly. I genuinely think the Sharks team is the worst team since we've gone to this this format. You know, the mm -hmm. there was the lockout in 03-04 that canceled... Uh, yeah, 04-05 yeah, that canceled an entire season. Since that lockout where the salary cap was instituted, I genuinely in my heart of hearts believe this is the worst. The Sharks are the worst team we have seen in the NHL since that since the lockout that canceled an entire season. An abomination of a hockey team. And that is very sad. But if you want to uh, listen to some good insight on the Sharks, head on over to Locked on Sharks because J.D. Young does a fantastic job holding down the fort there every season. But the special teams uh, is really what kept the Flames in the game last night. And kind of what kept them a little bit afloat, I would say, at the start of February. Um, you know, Jonathan Huberto, power play goals in this economy. Like, you, you don't get those very often. But in the penalty kill, that, that has been the one thing for like three seasons straight that this team has just been so good at. They have the horses for it. You know, they mm -hmm. have – we talk a lot about the Flames having redundant skill sets, guys who are all really good at one specific type of thing. And, and a lot of those traits translate very well to the penalty kill. You know, a lot of teams, they would be very content if they just had Michael Backlund as their best penalty killer. But you throw Manjapani in there. You throw the defenseman the Flames are able to throw at that situation as well. And talent-wise, that's one of the areas where the Flames gen genuinely are pretty well situated. You know, I know their penalty kill hasn't been great this season, but – the personnel for a good penalty kill is there. They're relatively middle of the pack. I, I can't, the, for whatever reason, this website that has the stat rankings, they don't have numbers next to the team names. But if I had to eyeball it, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleventh in the kill, that's not bad. You know, the personnel is there. The goaltending has been there this year. I know that that cliche i i hate to use it but your goalie is your most important penalty killer and when you have a goalie who's playing well like markstrom has this season that's going to translate well and the penalty kill this year has been decent and it was really important last night yeah and it's i really thought that thing that it would get a little bit worse with um especially chris tanov leaving i feel like he has 
really been the backbone of the penalty kill since he's been acquired or since the Flames signed him in free agency a few years ago. And I mean, yeah, sure, they were like top five and they've slid back to 10, 11. But that doesn't that's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. No, definitely not. I was I've been very impressed with the penalty kill this season relative to the situation they've had. Um special teams at large is an area where you would think a team like the Flames that doesn't have, you know, the blue chip type of guys, you th- you would think it would be a little bit harder to come by. And the penalty kill being where it is, that, you know, that that makes sense like we talked about, but when you go and look at the other aspect of special teams, you talk about the power play, it makes sense why they're in the bottom 5, 10 teams in the league, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27. Yeah, 26th in power play percentage. So When you don't have the guys to make those plays happen, that's where you can set your team apart. When you have strong, when you have strong individual talents, you can be a pretty mediocre team. But if you have strong individual talents, you can have a really good power play. And something I would highlight, Tampa Bay is leading the league in power play conversion rate this year. And, you know, Tampa Bay really really high end guys at the top of their lineup and I'm not going to say their power play is booing their team cuz that's not fair to the rest of that group but when you have the strong individual talents that's when you can really exploit the numbers game at the end of the day special teams are about exploiting your numbers advantage in hockey and we we overcomplicate it at times it's really simple You have more guys than them. Manipulate the space. At the end of the day, the reason we have structures and systems in place Mm -hmm. is it's all about manipulating positioning and your numbers advantage. On the power play, if you're not manipulating your numbers advantage, you're not setting your power play up for success. Yeah, and I mean, we did a whole episode about it earlier in the season when the power play was going through a horrific dry spell and you know you were able to break it down and you know in a sense that's not in a game where it's removed and you can actually discuss what's going on um but i I just do they bring mark savard back and leave the power play in his hands it's an interesting question. I, I forget where Mark Savard was before the Flames as a coach because I remember – St. I Louis wa- and Columbus? Coach, uh, concussion, awards, career, coaching. Because I, I, I can't remember if it was him – or if it was, I, I might be thinking of John McC- I might be thinking of John McLean, but retired player had a really, really rough go of it in a couple different stints running the power play, and it's hard. You know, this is something I I find eminently fascinating about coaching is that it's generally the guys who weren't good players who make the best coaches. You know, Mark Savard was a great player in his mm-hmm. day before the concussion issues forced him to retire prematurely. Genuinely, you know, I believe multiple times, 100 point forward, really decorated long career. And sometimes it's hard when you're that when you're that good to convey what you're trying to get across to guys who aren't as good as you. So I. I know um, the specialized coaches, whether it's power play, the kill, the goaltending, um, and any type of assistant head coach. That's an easy. Um, that's an easy solution. You know, that's the sugar rush of. Well, we're not going to retain this coach because of X. We're going to try and change things up. And those guys, they do have jobs to do, but they are not the difference between your power play being 26th and being 10th, you know, it's, it, it's not marks of all no. marks of arts fault. The power play is not good. Right. I mean, he, I feel like he's, he's done what he can with the pieces that he has. And you can only try so many different combinations before uh, it goes very South, but you know, I, I will give them 26. That's a lot better than 31 which is where they were at some point in the season. But coming up next, we're going to keep on trucking with some Jonathan Huberdeau stats, insight, and delightful conversation around the $10.5 million forward here at Locked on Flames. But before we do that, we are going to take a quick break, and I want to tell you about In 
Indeed. When you're drafting your fantasy team, do you ever wish you could handpick the best stars for your business team? If you're building your talent roster, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching, assessment, and virtual interviews. Hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Indeed knows when you're growing your business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for the quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring right now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out with us today on Locked on Flames. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcast p- podcasts as well as YouTube. Um, we're going to continue this show through the off season. If this is your first time, first season listening, we're, we're here for you. Quite literally every, well, not. It's not a threat, I promise. It's yeah. not a threat. <laughs> you don't have to listen to us. But if you want to like put on YouTube, something. But it's not a threat. Yeah. No, you can. We'd love to hear from you as well. So leave a five star rating and a nice little review if you so choose. You and I both talked a lot about the expectations for Jonathan Huberto heading into this season. Um, unless he magically racks up 30 points in five games, I don't think he's meeting my expectations. No. Um, We've talked about this a lot. The Flames did not know what they were getting. The Flames saw a guy who had 110, 116 points, whatever it was two years ago, who finished fifth in the Hart Trophy voting and figured he was system proof. If a player is that good, he'll figure it out no matter who we put with him or what we ask him to do. The talent is clearly there. He will be able to acclimate to whatever we ask him to do. That clearly hasn't happened. Um, There hasn't been... There hasn't been an honest account of why this hasn't worked because it's not just that Huberto has underperformed his counting stats and his traje- his career, his typical career performance. It's that mm-hmm. he fundamentally looks like a different hockey player. You know, he doesn't have that same cutting confidence to drive the net, to facilitate, to play make that made him one of the most talented player, made him one of the most gifted point producers in the entire league. And some of that is what the Flames ask their forwards to do, how they typically play. Uh, Some of it is confidence. You know, if you're, you can be as good as you want as a player, but if you don't have a feel for your game, you're not going to be able to perform. And that's largely been the case here. He's he's been better since the new year, since the start Mm -hmm. of the new year, he's got 33 points in 40 games, which that's not great. But if you extrapolated that out and you got to 66 points in eight, 80 games. That's not what you want for ten and a half million dollars, but it's palatable. You know, it's not egregious. It feels a little bit better than where we're currently sitting. Um, I just, it stinks because you wanted to think, believe, have Hope. faith hope anything any delusion even that this trade or the Matthew Kachuk trade was going to be somewhat even um this feels incredibly lopsided a year two it still is and I don't think it'll ever balance out um but it took Blake Coleman three years to settle in really do (laughs) I think that's different for a few reasons. Number one, 
a lot of Coleman's uptick in production is commiserate with more ice time. Um, there mm-hmm. isn't more ice time to give Huberto. It's not like he's a third liner and he's been matchup protected and they're waiting for, and they have guys they can afford to play ahead of him. I mean, in average time on ice, he's middle of the pack. You know, Kadri's ahead of him, Backlund's ahead of him. But that makes sense because those guys kill penalties. Mm-hmm. But at the end of all of it, he's going to be here. Uh, you're not getting rid of that contract unless you buy it no. out. And even if you buy it out, it's still not palatable to be bought out for at least another two or three years. Then it becomes a little more doable. But it it's it is pure copium at this point. There is no way to win this situation. That 115-point guy is not coming back. He's not as bad as he played last year. He's not as bad as he played in the first half of this season. I like to think that on a bad team, Huberto can put up 70 to 80 points and everyone will feel fine. No one will be ecstatic because ultimately the goal is to win. But if he's getting empty calorie counting stats on a bad team, you know, he's doing like a, I'm trying to think of a good version of this in hockey because all the references in my brain are from basketball because that's what <laughs> the good player bad team is most commiserate with because that's really the bar in basketball. If you're a good player and you go from a bad team to a good team, can you elevate that team? team or were you just putting up counting stats you know I, right. I i'm trying to think of the hockey equivalent of that someone who's on a really bad team for an extended period of time and then went somewhere else you know that type of Eric player Carlson? yeah but the sharks were decent the the senators mm-hmm. were decent you know he went on a couple playoff runs but that type of vein you know is this guy actually what he was or was he a product of his environment? And I think mm-hmm. it's relatively safe to say that the way Florida played was really conducive to what he wanted to do. It was high volume trading chances at both ends. It was all about creating offense and the flames as a team are a little bit more structured, a little bit more defensively oriented, a little more inclined to play dump and chase because they don't have the straight line foot speed to carry the puck into the zone with speed. And that's not something Huberto is great with, you know, what makes Huberto when Huberto's at his best, he is a dangerous playmaker. He's not going to score a ton of goals, but he's going to make the guys on the ice around him better because he's dang- because the defense has to respect where he is on the ice because he's such a good passer. That's the most important and that's the best element of his game is his ability to pass the puck into tight windows. And because the Flames don't have the high-end talent he had played with at during various points in Florida, he hasn't been able to put up the counting stats. And this gets to something I talk about all the time, which – what makes great players great are the one the guys who can make offense for themselves regardless of who they play with. That to me is what makes a great player. The guy who can make the zone entry and then facilitate the offense. You know, I, I wasn't surprised when Jack Hughes went nuts last year and put up 98 mm-hmm. points because the previous two seasons, you saw the zone entries. You saw the driving the net and the creativity. It was just a matter of the talent around him. You know, Rope Hints, same exact thing in Dallas. Really strong transition player Huberto is not a strong transition player he needs somebody to do that legwork for him to make him more dangerous and until then we're going to get these little glimmers of decent high-end plays we're all going to feel bad because this is a bad situation for everybody and we got to keep counting down the time on that contract that's really all it is yeah and I mean at least he has a little bit more confidence under his belt and it just it absolutely stinks like you said regardless of how you slice this it it stinks for everyone involved but I will say that he does appear to be you know more like himself and that confidence is slowly coming back like there's it's got to be so tough mentally to try to come back after last year and oh, be yeah. like I w- I went from the best that I've ever played to the worst I have ever played and that's such an extreme and we talk about extremes with the flames all the time and how they need extreme puck luck to win and th- they need a lot the panthers of luck. won the president's trophy 2 years ago yeah. as the best team in the league Huberto put up 115 points and finished fifth in the MVP voting. That is another planet. Yeah. (laughs) 
that's not yeah no jonathan huberdo i'm so sorry on behalf of brad tree living and everyone involved um they set him up they did not <laughs> we you see this every single off season you will see it every single off season the rest of your life teams that see talented player do not understand what makes that player successful mm-hmm. thinks they are system proof will drop them into their team and then be gobsmacked when it doesn't work. You know, you could point to Ryan Graves with the Penguins this year. That has failed miserably. You can talk yeah. about Severson with the Blue Jackets. That did not work out. You could talk about Barkley Goudreau with the Rangers. You could talk about Neil Pionk with the Jets. I, I could go on and on. There are a <laughs> lot of talented players in the NHL. You know, I, I and I know we're running long here, but I always say that to get to the NHL, you have to be good at something. You right. have to be good at something. There has to be one thing in your bag that you're particularly good at. Belichick always says there's no such thing as bad players. If there, if you have a bad player on your team, that's a reflection of your coach not putting you in a position to succeed. Yes. And coming up next, we are going to wrap up the show with uh, what went wrong this season. Because there's a lot that you can talk about there, but there are a few specifics. But first, we're going to take a quick break here, and I'm going to talk to you all about game time. I have decided that I will be going to Yankee Stadium this summer, and I'm going to get the chicken tender and a bucket hat that sits on top of the soda, and game time is going to make that possible because game time is now an authorized ticket seller marketplace or ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down closer to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in pricing, view from your seat, and lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Nick, you are an avid sports game attender. When will you be using Game Time next? Um, I think I'm going to the Met game on Sunday because they're retiring Doc Gooden's number. I got to make sure I'm going, but I, I will be using Game Time if I do get tickets. Save up to 60% off buying last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and anything else in your area with Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L. For $20 off, download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks everyone for hanging around with us today on Locked on Flames. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Just Belmosto and at Nick Sararis. The season went wrong as soon as it started. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Their gamble. Their big proposition was the problem was the coach last year, that the talent was there for the team to make the playoffs. You know, they missed the playoffs by, I think, three points last year. And it took a genuine effort to miss the playoffs last year. They had a million opportunities in the months of March and April to get in front of the Jets. Yeah, if they made the playoffs, Vegas would have smacked them around. Vegas probably would have beaten them four or five games. Vegas won the Stanley Cup with the biggest five-on-five goal differential of any team in the last 15 years. You know, They outscored opponents 66-33 to 33 in the playoffs last year at five-on-five. That's crazy. Genuinely one of the best playoff teams we've ever seen Vegas last year. But I think... I think the narrative of the team and the expectations of the team would have been very different if they made the playoffs last year, even if it was ugly, you know, even if they made it with like the 91, 92 points that the Jets got in with and got smoked. I think there would have been more of an inclination to run it back again with Daryl. I think there would have been more of an inclination that they need to keep pushing because they made the playoffs. We're not going to take a step back after making the playoffs. So maybe missing the playoffs last year, was a good thing for the long-term trajectory of the team. But as far as like this season's an abject like 
disaster as far as results you know the athletic did Mm -hmm. their study and like the range of outcomes and like this is like a bottom six or seventh percentile outcome for the flames this year the point total they're going to end up with and that's including the fact that they were playing reasonably well you know they were only like four or five points back of a playoff spot at the beginning of march they weren't that far away maybe that's a testament to like the bar being low but the flames did not have an atrocious first 40 50 games they were very mediocre but they weren't god awful and then in the last month they've been god awful but this point total for the season you know that when you are spending on the types of players the flames are spending on there's no other way to categorize it as other than an abject failure yeah and you know you can look at that and say well that's incredibly negative why would you say that this team has done x y and z well but have they sustained it no you know they had a great february yeah they went seven but, and three in february but that that's it it they slammed on the brakes because after the trade deadline they've won like four or five games it feels like it has not been it has not been much and i i don't really care that this is how it's ending because you know you were 14 points back of a playoff spot or wild the second wild card spot you you reap what you sow and they knew it we all knew it the defense resembles swiss cheese most nights so you you're not going anywhere with that When I was looking, I was genuinely a little shocked how high the models were on the Flames in the preseason. Like, the Athletic had the Flames, like, as a reasonably confident playoff team. Like, 71, 72% of the simulations as a playoff team. And, like, again, I know I said this for 82 games last year, (laughs) and they missed the playoffs by four points. By, like, stumbling over themselves, shooting themselves in the foot, kicking themselves in the butt for the entirety of the season. The Flames were not an untalented team. When you went looked at the roster last season and this season prior to the trade deadline that one through four of anderson Weger, hannafin tanev is one of the best one two three fours in the entire nhl not just in the west not just in in canada that is one of the best one through fours in the entire nhl there are a yep. lot of who are in the playoffs right now that would take that one through four or they are one through four you know you go look at the jets you go look i would dare say go look at the rangers other than adam fox you know you go look at you go look at carolina there's an argument you would take that one through four over those guys one through four markstrom gave you a genuine top seven eight goalie season in the entire league this year on a objectively bad team you know we're Mm -hmm. we're uh, stat here where is it where is it where is it and that's also after having a horrible season last year yeah. so to swing back like that like that's huge yeah he markstrom and i know there's a lot of conjecture about the quality of the public versus the private statistical models as far as gold tending value because the uh, the proprietary models that like um stats stats and information in canada and there's a couple other ones they have generally slightly different numbers in different goalies but markstrom when you've watched the flames has been their best player most nights he is objectively had one of the 10 best goalie seasons in the league i know his goals against average and his save percentage don't look good but when you go under the hood you look at the goal saved above expected you look at the high danger save percentage you know he has the highest high save high danger save percentage of any goalie in the entire league and his overall save percentage is still you know like 890 something which isn't good but it's a reflection of just how difficult the workload has been and then we haven't even talked about the forward group you know <laughs> you drop Lindholm, Backlund, Manjapani, Coleman, Kadri, Huberto. You drop any of those seven guys. I, I didn't mention Sharon Govich. I didn't mention Connor Zeri, who have both had good seasons. You drop any – that's up to nine guys right there. Those nine forwards, those are all talented hockey players. You know, none of those guys would be out of place on a good hockey team. And you got nine forwards, you're in the mix. So – and I understand that the direction of the team fundamentally shifted in about mid-February when they realized 
we're probably not even if we make the playoffs we're probably not gonna be able to make anything happen so we Mm -hmm. should probably take our medicine and trade these guys and i commend them for making the right decision but as far as like Five years from now, when people go back and look at the the point totals, the record, all that, they're going to say, how did a team that start the season with all this talent stink so bad? And yeah, they're three and 11 since the trade deadline. That's that's mostly (laughs) why it looks so bad. Yeah. And, you know, when we're old and do a look back on this season here in our 10th year, Locked on flames. Uh, we we will reference this episode again, but yeah, no, there there was an opportunity for things to go right, but they didn't. Completely agreed with you. You know, like 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 I said, and we we can wrap up on this note. There's a bottom five percent outcome. The top five percent outcome is that they're the Jets. That. That, that they have the jet season that hellebuck excuse me mm-hmm. that markstrom has the hellebuck season and they get point production from guys they weren't really expecting they maybe get kuberto to flirt with 80 to 90 points cadre in the same boat the jets mm-hmm. don't have any overwhelming superstar talent other than hellebuck but they have enough guys to be competitive and that's really that would have been the best possible outcome for the flames yeah and sometimes that's all it takes but That will do it for us here on today's episode of Locked on Flames. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, Make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube, as we carry you through the rest of the regular season and, of course, the off season. Uh, You can follow us on Twitter at Jess Balmosto and at Nick Zoraris, and we will see you tomorrow.